on September 11, 2001, I was actually off and I went to the polling site to vote in the primary for mayor. And I had just left the site when I got a phone call from my mother. And I thought she said, did you hear about the train? But my mother said, did you hear about the plane in the World Trade Center? And I was shocked. I ran home, put on the TV and the morning news was on and I see one of the towers on fire. So I said, I have to get into work. So I changed quickly, my hair was wet. I had to just blow it out, put on my blazer, and I, my husband was going to take me to the number seven train in Flushing. By the time I was going out the door, the second tower had been hit. When I heard the first plane, I thought that's odd, but I knew that there had been a plane, a small plane that hit another big building in New York years before. As soon as I heard the second plane, I knew it was terrorism. But even the first time, the first plane, I, I thought it was odd. So, but it was the second plane that really convinced me that it was an act of terror. My husband drove me to Flushing, to the number seven line, and I got into the subway, and the doors weren't closing. And very quickly, we heard the announcement, this train is going nowhere, you have to leave the train. So I went upstairs and I grabbed a bus but the bus was only going as far as 52nd Street in Woodside, Queens. That wasn't far enough. So for the first time in my life, I hitched a ride. There was an elderly Greek man driving a pickup truck and I was hitching and he let me on and he took me to the base of the 59th Street Bridge. So I started running over the bridge to get into Manhattan and there were thousands of people coming toward me away from Manhattan. I did think to myself, it's ironic that I'm running toward what could be perceived as danger while thousands are running the opposite way. But that's my job as a journalist. I have to report the news and it's just instinct. When I got to the assignment desk, I noticed there was a stack of tapes. And I said, did anyone look at these tapes yet? And no one had because of the emergency. And they were relying on the static shot that we had of the Twin Towers. So I said, I'm taking these tapes. I went into an edit room and they were unbelievably stunning what we had on tape. One of our cameramen was under the South Tower when it was hit by the plane. So he captured the explosion and he, he captured the chaos that followed people that were in an adjacent building running out the revolving doors, screaming, trying to get away. There was a man who was picked off the ground and you know led away. And it was it was very, very compelling footage from a TV standpoint. So that day, I got to the newsroom about 10.30 and the towers had just collapsed. And I would say that I worked that night until about 1.30 in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. So we got a hotel room up the block and the news director wanted me back fast. But you know, what I should mention is, Kaidi and Jim Watkins, who was the anchor at the time, Kaidi and Jim were on the air for several hours and then Heidi was concerned about her son, who was a student at Stuyvesant High School, so she needed to take a break. So at that point, Marvin Scott and I started filling in for hours at a time when Jim and Heidi would take a break. One thing that stands out about that day, 10.30 at night, I'm on the air, and we hear that there are 343 firefighters missing, and that was just a stunning number. Three months before 9-11, I had covered the Father's Day fire and three firefighters died on Father's Day. Terrible thing. I covered all three of those funerals. And one of the priests very involved with those funerals was Father Michael Judge, chaplain of the fire department. And he is the first official listed casualty of 9-11. He responded to the Twin Towers and he was killed that day. I knew that there would be people that I knew among the lost. And one of them was a man named Vito DeLeo. He was from Staten Island. I met Vito during the first World Trade Center bombing. Vito was live on the air with me after the first World Trade Center bombing, and I believe his eardrum had been blown out. We stayed friendly for the next eight years. So when I heard about the towers, I was wondering about Vito. Nine o'clock, I was called desperately by this woman, Sally DeLeo, in Staten Island. Her husband, Vito, survived the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Mm -hmm. She called me to hear if I heard anything because she said if Vito had a way to get to a phone, he would get to a phone. So she was crying, and I tried to reach him on his beeper. It wasn't working, of course, because most of the telephones were out of service. It turned out that Vito had gone back in to help rescue people, and he didn't make it out. Vito died in the second bombing.
I worked the whole week, very, very long hours, and finally was home on Sunday and went to church. And at the end of the Mass, they played God Bless America, and I just stood there and sobbed in the pew. And that's something I'll always remember. You think of Pearl Harbor, this was the Pearl Harbor of my lifetime. And the sheer brutality of what happened to the people on those planes and in those towers and in the Pentagon and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, it'll never leave me.